The choice between abinutuzumab and rituximab is a discussion between uh, the patient and the physician. In my personal practice, I would strongly favor abinutuzumab in those patients um, whom I think would be at highest risk of uh, progression within the first 24 months after induction therapy. Again, we don't necessarily know who those patients are. Uh, we can't predict them with certainty. However, patients who have high FLEPI score, advanced stage disease, uh, who have high LDH, beta-2 microglobulin, uh, would be prime candidates for a combination of abinutuzumab and chemotherapy. In, in this particular case, I would use bendamustin abinutuzumab. Um, well, so the flip side of this is that patients who receive uh, abinutuzumab uh, are at high risk of infection, uh, particularly during maintenance um, uh, uh, phase of therapy. And that's what I would be discussing with my patients, discussing the increased risk of infections with this agent. I could also consider sometimes um, uh, con con uh, undergo, uh, treating patient with induction uh, with abinutuzumab chemotherapy and then not following through with maintenance, uh, but that would not necessarily be how the study was designed. The safety profile of abinutuzumab and rituximab is um, actually quite similar. Uh, both agents are associated with infusion-related reactions. However, the risk of those reactions would be higher with abinutuzumab compared with rituximab. Um, I do see uh, uh, cytopenias with, uh, in patients treated with abinutuzumab more frequently than in patients treated with rituximab. I use this agent both in follicular lymphoma and in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and uh, um, uh, the side effects are quite similar there. Uh, the cytopenias with both of these agents typically tend to be quite transient, however, and they typically do not use any growth factors. And uh, uh, those patients uh, very, very rarely require uh, transfusions to maintain the platelet common count, al almost never. Uh, therefore, both drugs uh, appear um, very safe. Um, I do warn my patients that uh, who I treat with abinutuzumab that infusion-related reactions are very common and uh, uh, will happen um, uh, very frequently. However, they can be quite easily managed in the infusion room. Furthermore, bo bo both drugs are associated with some rare uh, complications such as delayed neutropenia, um, as well as progressive multifocal encephalopathy, leukoencephalopathy, and this tends to be a class effect of uh, anti-CD20 antibodies. And um, um, it, there is no data that one or other drug uh, is, uh, puts patients at high risk. Both of them have infusion-related reactions. However, obinutuzumab does have a higher rate of infusion-related reactions, closer to about 60% compared to about 45% with rituximab. So when you, when you administer obinutuzumab, you, you would uh, use the same protocol of slow infusion and increasing the rate of the infusion as the patient tolerates it, and then having a protocol in place for addressing any infusion-related reactions if and when they occur. However, there is a higher rate of that, so I think you have to use caution with someone in whom has a history of significant sensitivity to medications, who has a history of anaphylaxis, or if they've been treated with rituximab previously and they also had a high risk of infusion-related reactions, those patients may be at higher risk of developing an infusion-related reaction with obinutuzumab. They're more likely to occur during the first infusion. They do tend to decrease over time. You can pre-medicate patients with corticosteroids, with Benadryl, things like that. So you can mitigate that over time, but usually it's the very first infusion. So a patient that has neutropenia, for example, um, would have to probably delay their treatment and either get growth factor support or let some time pass between their treatments uh, or a, a longer time elapse, delay treatment in other words, if they have neutropenia. If someone has anemia and it's um, not severe anemia, not grade three anemia, you may not necessarily delay treatment for anemia. You might delay treatment for cytopenia such as thrombocytopenia. So I think that the dose limiting uh, so sort of the, uh, the treatment limiting cytopenias are more often than not will include neutropenia, which we can handle with either growth factor support or delaying treatment and allowing the patient to recover until their next cycle.